Are humans neutral? Our text this morning is going to be drawn from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this day. May we hear and may we understand the hard words of your word. May we obey them. May we live by them. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The 1953 short story by Flannery O'Connor, A Good Man is Hard to Find, revolves around the idea that a truly good person is hard to find. Everyone in the story is deeply flawed, as O'Connor, a writer in the Southern Gothic tradition who spoke of a Christ-haunted South, wrote from a biblical worldview. And in the Bible, it teaches us that since the fall, a good man isn't just hard to find, a good man is impossible to find. A good man is impossible to find. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 18. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. And it says there in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Now we're continuing this trajectory that we began here in the beginning of the book of Romans. We saw the gospel. We saw the gospel as the announcement of the reign and rule of the Christ. We saw that the gospel was announced beforehand. And in the gospel and through the gospel, the people of God are saved. But the gospel is a two-edged sword because it reveals the justice and righteousness of God. It reveals true justice and true righteousness, and because of that, it shows us our unrighteousness. You see, God is not changing his standards. God's not going to dumb things down. He's not going to dumb down his holiness. He's not going to come after the fall and say, you disobeyed me, Adam and Eve, therefore I'll just erase away your sin. God didn't decide simply to destroy the creation and start over from scratch. But God continues on in a work of restoration, and a payment must be made. Justice must be carried out. And for those who will not live by faith, as we saw last week, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. There is the revealed wrath of God. Going on to verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. The creation shouts the creator to all. In fact, our hearts long to see these things and to understand these things. That's why we love stories about superheroes. That's why we sense that things aren't right when we see sin and we see all kinds of wickedness carried out in the world. We long for an end to these things, but the implications are too much for the sinner. We see the righteousness of God. We see the fact that he is revealed through creation, and yet at the same time, we don't want to repent. We don't want to submit. We like our sin. Now, as Calvin said, the creation is an amphitheater for the creator. If you look out there at night and you see the stars of the heavens, and you say, that couldn't have just happened by chance. The mystery of photosynthesis, why there's water and water filled with all kinds of teeming creatures at all. The fact that we as human beings are self-aware and can ask these questions and even ponder them lead us to the conclusion that there's a creator. Psalm 19, verse 1 through 4 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Creation itself proclaims the Creator, screams the Creator, and yet we will not submit to it. But no one anywhere at any time is without any excuse. Now, what we're looking at here is what is known as general revelation. General revelation. 
on the last day, no one anywhere is going to be able to say, I had no idea there was a creator. All along the creation was screaming into his ears that there is a God. And this is what is known as revelation that is sufficient, sufficient. It was sufficient for one to know that there was a God, and yet it's not efficient to save. That's special revelation. That's the Holy Spirit taking the heart of stone and making it alive. That's the word of God that falls under the rubric of special revelation that shows us exactly what God wants and how God has carried these things out in the works of salvation. Going on in verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is the trajectory of humanity from the fall. And the trajectory of the human race, according to the Bible, is not as anthropologists would tell us from pantheism seeing God in things seeing God actually of those things he's actually that tree over there or that rock going on to becoming more sophisticated in polytheism where these gods of pantheism then became more sophisticated and have personalities moving on to monotheism at the end of the day with high levels of sophistication and believing in one God but rather it's the other way around it is from one God that humanity understood going forth from the fall and from the garden to increasingly darkened hearts and foolish thinking. If you don't believe this, take a look at what goes on in the post-Christian West. You would think that they would have the high point of what they believe as atheism, and yet they long, they long to have gods. And so you look at Europe now, and they're becoming more polytheistic, even pantheistic, worshiping the creation itself. Because they destroyed worship in cathedrals. They have to recreate sacraments with all of their bizarre symbolism. People long for God, but they don't want to submit to the true and living God. And so their hearts were darkened from worshiping the Creator. From worshiping the Creator as His images. From worshiping the Creator as His images to worshiping images of creatures. Verse 24. Therefore... Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You want something bad enough? You want to press against God? You want to throw his word out? You want to shake your fist at the heavens? God will give you what you want. If you hate God, if you hate his word and seek to do things according to your own understanding, following your own heart. By the way, kids, don't follow your own hearts. If you're a Christian, your heart can be a decent standard, but always test it by the word of God. We're always so easily led astray into sin. Following after your own heart, he'll let you have it. Now we see here what happened here. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. The word there is sabazomai. Sabazomai means to stand in fear and awe of. They stood in fear and awe of the creation. The creation itself was to stand in fear and awe of man who was made in the image of God. But in their sin, mankind reversed it. And they stood in fear and awe of the creation itself. Look around us now. People are frightened to death of Mother Nature. They're not afraid of the true and living God. They're afraid of what's going to happen with global warming, that our planet's going to catch on fire, that solar flares are going to destroy us, that the created order itself has now become the God that people bow down to rather than the true and living God. Our images of creatures are more modern we look at the ancient past and we say, oh, we'd never bow down to a little image made out of wood or hay or stubble, a little image made out of metal. But what do we do? Who do we bow down to in the modern age? Do you bow down to the God of money? Do you spend more time thinking about money and the acquisition of money and what you would do for money than you do thinking about the word of God or reading his word? 
Is your God the God of power? Oh, if I had power and influence. Oh, if I could build up my my social media presence and have five million followers and get monetized and everybody will say what a great person you are and how you influence things. Is your God coolness? This is one for you young people. You want to be cool. You spend your time trying to be cool. You spend all of your time trying to figure out all the new trends. You want to be trendy and you don't care about anything else. Is your God the gods of political movements? Do you bow down to the new sacraments of Antifa or Black Lives Matter? And for us on the right, is our God conservatism and the American flag? We must worship the true and living God according to his word. Verse 26. So, they turned away from God. They turned to false gods. And now we see in verse 26, for this reason... For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations, and women were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And you'll hear people today, even in the church, saying, homosexuality is not wrong. Same-sex marriage is not a sin. That's the God of the Old Testament. That's back in the law. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah happened in the Old Covenant. Well, here it is, played out for us once again, right in the middle of the New Testament, in the teaching of St. Paul. Jesus held up the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as a motif for things. But notice what happens here. With homosexuality, it's not simply a sin, but rather, it's a rejection of God's order. And because of sin, God turns people over into a lifestyle that inverts the created order. You want to do things your own way? God will let you have it. And you'll take creation and flip-flop it. But you'll have to live with the consequences. Men and women were created differently. They were complete, com- uh, created compatibly. They were created congruently. And I know this has fallen into disfavor in our circles, but complementarily, they are not the same. And to say that men and women are exactly the same is anti-God. It is an unbiblical lie. Decide you want to remake creation however your darkened heart sees it, he'll let you. Homosexuality is a serious breach of creation and causes futility, sterility, and wrath. We take the created order, how God made it in the beginning. He made them man and woman and said, be fruitful and multiply. Go and fill the earth and have dominion over my creation. Be my vice regents and rule well. And we say, we're going to do it our own way. We're going to make the creation our God. We're going to say, thank you very much, God, for the gift of marriage, but we're going to recreate it any way we want. Men and women are exactly the same. That's a method of destruction even from a physical sense. Going on to verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. This is what mankind does. This is what we do as human beings apart from God. This is what we would do to its fullest extent if God did not intervene. Mankind became more darkened and less good the farther we have wandered from the, God, from the garden. God gave them over to their own debased minds to do what ought not to be done. And friends, God hates these things. Let me read from you something from the Proverbs. Many of you are probably aware of this, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, but maybe some of you young, young people don't know this. Some of you are heading off to college here soon, and you'll hear people say, God's the God of love. And so you can't make any judgments on anything. You can't say this is wrong. This is unrighteous. This is unholy. But friends, God does hate. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 18, it says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord amongst brothers. And this is by no means a complete list for God is holy, God is righteous, God is just, and God hates sin. 
Friends, we are to hate sin too. We are to hate sin in ourselves. We're to hate sin that we see out here. We're to long. We're to long for that sin to be abated, to be kept under control. But the old saw is true. Hate the sin and love the sinner. Hate the sin and love the sinner. But God hates sin. And what does God hate? He hates sin in all of its forms. He hates things like homosexuality and bending genders in all of its forms. People say, why do you focus on these things? You Christians, you're always focused on one thing. Well, you know, if we were living in another generation, the godless would have said it was something else. Whatever they're doing, whatever the big issue of the day is, whatever the big heresy of the day is, if you focus on it, they'll say, why do you focus on that thing? I suppose if we lived in the first three centuries, they would say, why do you keep focusing on the deity of Christ? Don't you ever think about anything else? Well, friends, we've got to focus on the sins and the pathologies of our day. Going on to verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And let me tell you, friends, God hates those things. God hates these things, and Christians are accused of privileging some sins over another. Why do you always focus on sex, they ask us these days? Because it's the great heresy of our day. But we should refuse to give up an inch to such lies. Things like gay pride. We point that out. We pray against it. We preach against it. We teach our children against these things. And they say, why do you only focus on that? Really? Really? Christians have always focused on all sin. Do you see Christians out having big movements and parades for murder pride? Do you see Christians having big festivals for gossip pride? Do you see Christians carrying the banner for slanderer pride or disobedience to parents pride? We should watch out for that, that we're not overly focused on one thing or another. But don't let anybody beat you over the head because you're focused on the big heresy of the day. Verse 32, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. General revelation screams the glory of God from the created order and the moral law the ten commandments is written on all men's hearts you go anywhere in the world you'll see that by and large people understand the ten commandments they are universals all men know what is good but as a race we have pushed that way down because our hearts are bad to the point that we love and teach others to delight in sin we see that even in the church The sad fact is a good man isn't just hard to find. A good man, according to God's holy standard, is impossible to find. A good man is impossible to find, except the man sent from heaven, who is the only way to killing and resurrecting our fallen human race, the God-man. In the film 12 O'Clock High, General Frank Savage takes command of a hard luck bomber group, a group of men broken by impossible, endless, dangerous, and deadly daylight bombing raids. He pushes them hard in their deadly work, and in the end, he breaks down himself because it's impossible to push men beyond their limits. The human race has been pushed beyond its impossible limits with the sin and death that came into the world because of sin and disobedience and its resulting curses from the fall of Adam. Where can a good man be found? Well, there's only one, the man from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, because as we've seen this morning in Romans chapter 1, a good man is impossible to find. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you that your son, the true good man, came into the world, came into the world to live and die and rise from the dead, to resurrect the world out of the sewer that it's become, 
to make us alive in him and through him alive to you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.